Welcome to our Let's Make Lemonade presentation. We realize that this has been one crazy year for everyone, especially all our families who are dealing with so many uncertainties during very uncertain times. So here in Special Services, our motto this year has been, we are gonna take all the lemons that have been thrown at us and we are going to make lemonade out of them. So join us for this presentation and hopefully too, we can teach you how to make a little bit of lemonade. The goal of this presentation is going to be a discussion that we're just going to start regarding how we, as a community of parents and educators, can support emotionally healthy, resilient, successful learners. We all know that academic success and life success depends much more on than just academic success alone. Now, more than ever before, we need our children to develop the social emotional skills necessary to be emotionally healthy, resilient, and successful learners. So what we're going to go through tonight is the development of social emotional learners so that we can work with you so that your children can truly be successful in life. You're going to have the opportunity tonight to meet a few of our child study team members throughout the district. These child study team members are great resources through anyone in the district, teachers, parents, and students. So at any point, always feel free to reach out to them. What we're going to cover tonight is the responsibility of decision-making. We're gonna talk about coping, we're gonna talk about communication, and then we're gonna talk about self-care. Ms. Kristen Mercario is going to talk about how we are coping. What are your expectations? How are we managing right now? Ms. Jess Dubois then is gonna talk about communication. We're under a great deal of stress presently. How, what, are, how, what are we saying and how are we saying it? How are we speaking to one another and how are we listening to one another? And then finally, Ms. Maria Wartenberg is gonna talk about self-care. Are we taking care of ourselves? What are we doing to take care of ourselves? And how are you engaging in self-care? Hi, I'm Christine Mercurio, and I'm a school psychologist in the district. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about coping. First, I'd like to begin by defining SEL, which you hear a lot about in the district. So SEL is just the process of acquiring and effectively applying the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to recognize and manage emotions. So that big fancy definition really just means how do we use what we know and how we feel to make effective decisions and manage and cope in life today? I'm gonna to begin by defining castle competencies which drive SEL. And castle competencies are defined as self-awareness, self-management, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making. The competency of responsible decision-making in particular impacts our ability to cope in an effective way and to make decisions that support a healthy social emotional balance. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Isn't responsible decision-making what competency of coping is all about? And how are we as adults coping at this time? And what does coping mean for you? I'm not sure if we ever sit down and really think about those questions, but thinking about them and concretizing them will definitely help how we cope in a healthy manner. So first we need to define our expectations. And it really helps to do this concretely with someone who can guide and provide objectivity. In education and IEP planning, this would be your case manager and child study team. Call it emotional academic budgeting, if you will. When I refer to a budget, I'm only referring to the cost benefit analysis of our emotional resources or our emotional bank. 
we do not have an endless supply of mental and emotional energy. So we really need to take an inventory of our priorities, our goals, and determine reasonable, individualized expectations. This will guide how we reach our goals in a healthy manner. And as with an IEP, we need to consistently reevaluate our academic emotional resources and our capacity from time to time, because these can change. We really need to acknowledge that during this time and throughout life, we need to consistently reevaluate and reassess our expectations to establish realistic goals and the methods of obtaining those goals. Next slide. When we enter situations in life with a set of expectations, when we feel we are not prepared or we do not have the knowledge base or we feel unsure, we experience stress, anxiety, and worry. So what happens? We Google, we Facebook, we chat with friends, and that's great and that's comforting and it can give us perspectives. However, to really cope and establish effective decision-making, we need an objective person. And for educational planning, again, that would be your case manager and child study team. Sometimes different perspectives and Googling can have an adverse effect and increase just enough or make worse your worries. So our ability to cope depends on our ability to think flexibly, take in expert perspective, and to some degree adjust our expectations. That certainly does not mean lowering the bar of excellence. It means establishing the academic, social, emotional balance or prescription, if you will, for your child. Next slide. While we want to provide the best and protect our children from the discomforts of life, coping means we all need to fall and experience discomfort in, in, in order to problem solve. Removing challenges removes the opportunity to develop coping skills. Responsible decision-making in no way means making the perfect decision. It just means making the best decision for who your child is as a learner with your case manager and child study team to help guide that process with you. I'd like to stop for a moment and turn to um, a little video you may have heard or seen. It's about grit and how coping through responsible decision-making requires grit. I'm gonna start that video. We're not gonna go through the whole thing, just a couple of minutes. When I was 27 years old, I left a very demanding job for a job that was even more demanding, teaching. I went to teach seventh graders math in the New York City public schools. And like any teacher, I made quizzes and tests. I gave out homework assignments. When the work came back, I calculated grades. What struck me was that IQ was not the only difference between my best and my worst students. Some of my strongest performers did not have stratospheric IQ scores. Some of my smartest kids weren't doing so well. And that got me thinking. The kinds of things you need to learn in seventh grade math, sure, they're hard. Ratios, decimals, the area of a parallelogram. But these concepts are not impossible. And I was firmly convinced that every one of my students could learn the material if they worked hard and long enough. After several more years of teaching, I came to the conclusion that what we need in education is a much better understanding of students and learning from a motivational perspective, from a psychological perspective. In education, the one thing we know how to measure best is IQ. But what if doing well in school and in life depends on much more than your ability to learn quickly and easily. So I left the classroom 
and I went to graduate school to become a psychologist. I started studying kids and adults in all kinds of super challenging settings. And in every study, my question was, who is successful here and why? My research team and I went to West Point Military Academy. We tried to predict which cadets would stay in military training and which would drop out. We went to the National Spelling Bee and tried to predict which children would advance farthest in competition. We studied rookie teachers working in really tough neighborhoods, asking which teachers are still going to be here in teaching by the end of the school year? And of those, who will be the most effective at improving learning outcomes for their students? We partnered with private companies asking, which of these salespeople is going to keep their jobs? And who's going to earn the most money? In all those very different contexts, one characteristic emerged as a significant predictor of success. And it wasn't social intelligence, it wasn't good looks, physical health, and it wasn't IQ. It was grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. Grit is having stamina. Grit is sticking with your future, day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Okay, Grit is living here. life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. A few Okay, we're going to turn back to the slides. So that's just the beginning of that video by Angela Duckworth. Um, she has a great book as well. I encourage you to watch the rest of the video, but we're going to move forward to our next slide, which is an introduction of our child study team in each building. Yep, so we're going to start. I'm going to move the screen over. We're going to start with our school social workers. We have Karen Albert at the elementary level, Patricia Cotto at the high school, and Meredith Ross, who is at the high school and, and often helps us out at the elementary level. Jess dubois Hyder, who's with us today. She is our social worker at the elementary and middle school level. Jane McGarry, also at the elementary and middle school levels. Our school psychologist, Karen Martin, is at the elementary level. Jennifer Dempsey, also at the elementary level. And I'm there too. Our school psychologists at the middle school are Lisa Romano and Jordan Marcus. And our school psychologists at the high school are Stephanie Isaacson, Kim Surrett, and Marie Burtenberg, who is with us today. Our learning disability teacher consultants, our LDTCs, are Kristen Roach, she is at the elementary level, Jenna Halpin, also at the elementary level, Debbie Bounet is at WAMS, and Margie Murray, who is at Ridge. So the preliminary takeaway for today regarding coping is that we need to set our expectations, our priorities, lean on our connections at school for IEP development. That would be your case manager and child study team. And that when we learn to fall, we learn to get up. I'm gonna turn it over now to Jessica Dubois who's going to speak to us about communication. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jessica Dubois. As uh, Christine said, I work at Cedar Hill and uh, William Annan. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about communication and six effective ways to communicate with your child. Um, as we're reviewing these slides, uh, these are a lot of components that we use uh, across the board in the behavioral disabilities program. So families that have their child enrolled in this program, you'll be very familiar 
um, with speaker power, which is another way of redirecting your child to understand that when one person's talking, the other person's listening. Listening position is just making sure that the students, especially when they're in school, um, are listening to the person that is speaking with their you know, whole body listening that we talk about, um, using your brain, using your eyes, using all of your senses in order to make sure that you're fully listening. Um, active listening, again, is <clears throat> making sure that you're really understanding the meaning of what uh, the person is communicating to you and really listening to those details. Keeping calm is another strategy that we use for students when we're trying to problem solve with them. So we're really trying to facilitate their regulatory skills or maintaining self-control. And the steps that we use for that are tell yourself to stop, tell yourself inside to try to keep calm, slow down your breathing with two long deep breaths, and praise yourself for doing a good job. So while I'm driving in the car, <laughs> which is one of my triggers, um, I try to tell myself to calm. Right? Um, so this is something that you would obviously practice and show your kids in the car. So my two girls, while I'm driving, if I'm in traffic, um, I try to recite these things out loud to model that, uh, you know, those keeping calm strategies. Okay, next slide. Okay, number five is be your best. We love this. This is a really great way to redirect your kids. Um, be your best means body posture, eye contact, speech, which is your choice of words, and then the tone of voice. So it's really, um, you know, you know, when 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 this when your child is learning this strategy, it's a really good way to speak to them in a neutral manner about are you using your best? Was that the correct way? Um, you know, uh, you know, was your tone of voice correct? Uh, did you choose your words wise, wisely? Um, you know, were you looking at me when we were having this conversation? And it's a nice neutral way to redirect. Um, and then the last one is bucket filling versus bucket dipping. This is a curriculum that we uh, that we teach across the board in all the schools at the elementary school at at, at the elementary level um, for uh, you know character education through the guidance department. And it just talks about you know being a, a contributing member to your family, to the your school community, being a great friend. And so when we are talking about, you know, choices that, you know, your child may be making, we do talk to them extensively about, was that a bucket filling thing that you did? Or was that a bucket dipping thing that you did? So um, these are just another, you know, a fun way to kind of approach language uh, in a neutral manner to kind of open up that dialogue with your child um, that gives them, you know, an opportunity to really process what's going on, the choices that they're making, okay? All right, and now moving on to expected and unexpected. Um, we really talk a lot about uh, expected and unexpected, um, and, you know, we'll go over both, you know, both of those things, and as you can see on the list, uh, expected behavior, we want to make sure that we're giving a behavior-specific praise, we'll catch our kids being good, making sure that we're reinforcing all the positive choices that they're making. Um, you know, we're, we want to make sure that we're also reviewing what exactly we want, you, you know, very explicitly what we want and what we expect. Um, you know, when, when a kids uh, have a target, they can hit the target if it's clear every single time. Um, making it making any type of things uh, like redirection very brief and to the point and making sure that they're aware of, you know, how their behavior impacts other people around them. This is really important because our kids, especially younger kids, are very egocentric and they don't realize that, you know, when I do X, this impacts my classmates, this impacts my teachers, this impacts uh, my, my family at home. So these are the types of things that we really want them to kind of look outside themselves to see how this impacts uh, um, <clears throat> their environment. And then just being genuine, making sure that you're giving feedback to your kids that's really genuine. Things that they can already do and they're capable of doing, they don't really need a lot of praise for them. That, but really making sure that you're encouraging things like tenacity and encouraging things that, you know, I know this was really hard for you, kiddo, but I really like how you tried. You took two deep breaths and you kept on trying. And th those are the types of things that, you know, we saw about, you know, in the video that Christine shared with us about grit. 
Then unexpected behavior, we talk a lot about uh, this. Again, this is another term that I think is really important when we're talking um, because when we're talking to our kids about the choices that they make that are unexpected. And the reason why I like this term is because it provides a neutral platform for us to talk to our kids about something that they did was unexpected. There's no triggering language that would be like, you know, that's so bad, that's terrible, that's inappropriate. These words that they are, they're kind of saturated with. Um, if you say, wow, that was really unexpected, it's very neutral. So when we're talking about that, we want to make sure that we're pinpointing the problem, that we're making sure that your objective is very clear to them. You know, they might have done five things all together that were probably unexpected, but what is your uh, primary objective? We want to make sure that we identify that and talk about that. We want to use assertive communication and be very clear. We want to make sure, again, that um, their unexpected behaviors um, and how that translates into the, the larger environment. And last, lastly, we really want to talk to them about how can we fix this problem together? I'm on your side. I'm on your team. Let's talk about this challenge. Okay, you did X, Y, and Z. So how can we solve this problem? And we work with them to kind of make sure that they understand some of other strategies or coping skills that they can use to make a better choice when they're confronted with the same situation situation next time. So that's expected and unexpected. Okay, and the last, uh, you know, the last thing to kind of wrap up communication is just the key elements when you're talking to uh, your child to help them to open up and take ownership for some of the things that they're doing. Okay, using neutral language is really important. And that's why we talked a little bit about some of this, the six communication strategies and expected and unexpected behavior. Um, what behavior or action was observable? So we want to make sure that we're fact check checking and making sure that we're identifying what we can observe. Um, there might be an, ex an example of that would be if, um, you know, a child, you, you know, your child is really frustrated and, uh, you know, while they're doing their homework and snaps the pencil in half, you observed that they snapped the pencil in half. You're surmising that they, they might be frustrated, but that's not, that, that may not be what they're, um, you know, um, feeling. So it, I would suggest that you would approach your child and say, wow, I, I noticed that you snapped your pencil. Pencil. You know, can you tell me a little bit about that? That was really unexpected. And then, then they would have the opportunity. What were you thinking? What were you feeling in that moment? Okay, what can we do to make this better? How can we, you know, do we need to have a break? Do you need to review the lesson again? You know, all of those types of things and teaching them and working through those problem solving skills is really important. Avoiding triggering words. Again, a lot of times we use words such as calm down when people are very escalated. Um, so those types of things that you know that might be triggering to your child, um, those, you know, making sure that your your choice of words is really important. Um, compartmentalizing, this is a really great strategy. Um, again, going back to the snapping of the pencil, um, we can say now, okay, was that a big problem or a little problem that you didn't understand number two on your map? on your math assignment today. That was a little problem, right? But your reaction was really big because you snapped that pencil, right? So what can we do next time to change it? So instead, so so we want to make sure that we compartmentalize the problem and size it down a bit for our kiddos so that they understand that not only, you know, that th their reaction was really big and next time maybe we can make, make a better choice. Um, giving direct and specific feedback is also very good, making sure that we're identifying exactly what they what targets we want them to hit. And lastly, that perspective of taking skill is super important. You know, if, you know, again, that, that same reaction that if a student was having snapping their pencil in class, like, what would your friends think? What would your teacher think? You know, what, what, how are you feeling about yourself and making sure that how, what they're doing and how, you know, how they're presenting their behaviors to other people, they, it, it, making sure that they understand that perspective taking ab abilities to, you know, if that was your friend, what would you say to your friend that was snapping that pencil? So those are that those are just, you know, a couple key elements to make sure that your child is opening up, taking ownership for their, um, you know, for their positive actions and some of their challenge, more challenging actions. Um, and so I encourage you to take um, a moment and just think about how you can use language to communicate with your child to get them to open up. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Marie Wartenberg. As Chris said, I am the school psychologist at the high school level, and I'll talk a little bit about self-care. And so a lot of us probably think that self-care is um, maybe spa days or yoga days, 
Uh, and it's not necessarily, it could be, but not necessarily. Self-care is different for everyone. <clears throat> so what I have on the screen here is a stress level bell curve. And so the green is, those are the people that are very laid back. Maybe they're a little frustrating for you because they are so laid back, nothing gets done. Um, and then to the right, you have the orange and red, which are the people who are so anxious and so stressed that nothing gets done because they're just perhaps so frozen, they don't know what the next step is gonna be. So we as human beings operate positively with a little bit of stress. It initiates us to do tasks, to complete things. So we wanna fall within that orange level. And that orange level is right up until we start to become fatigued. So we wanna make sure that we can take care of ourselves before becoming fatigued and before hitting that exhaustion level. Because we all know, once we're exhausted, we're laying on the couch, we're binging Netflix. We are not getting up and emptying the dishwasher and making dinner. So kids feel the same thing. They become exhausted and they can't handle any more stress. They can't initiate tasks. They have difficulty completing what they've started. They can't follow directions. They become um, loud. They start to um, show outbursts. So how do we help students prevent that. So there's two types of self-care. The first one is temporary self-care. That's going to dinner with your friends, sleeping in, yoga on Sundays, and the mighty once I. So once I lose weight, once I get married, I'll be happy. Once I have kids, it'll be wonderful. Once I get divorced, it'll be great. Um, and we always are looking to the future. We're not finding that happiness and we're not taking care of ourselves. So dinner with friends is great, yoga is great, absolutely. But it provides short bursts of endor endorphins within your brain. And as soon as the activity is over, they subside. So there's no enduring self-care. And that's where we come to the second type of self-care, which is the enduring self-care. These are things that we can weave into our lives and to our days. Every minute of every day, we sit and we think, what do I need in this moment? So it may be, taking a tea break throughout the day. I have a colleague who every day after lunch, she has a little tea, she takes five minutes for herself and then she's ready to go for the afternoon. Um, taking five minutes to look out the window, um, just take those deep breaths, calm yourself. And most importantly, routines. We thrive on routines, our kids thrive on routines. Um, so I'll get a little, I'll get more into those routines in a little bit, but for enduring self-care, we want to focus on self-regulation and emotion management. And I know um, Jess kind of touched on this with communication, but self-regulation is really important, especially teaching it young to the little kiddos. And so how do you teach that? One of my favorite things is freeze dance freeze tag, mother may I, the old school games that we all used to play as kids. When we, when we um, play freeze dance, the kids get all excited and they're moving their bodies and shaking. And then you yell freeze, you stop the music and they have to stop. They have to take breaths, regulate their body so that they don't move. This is teaching that emotion management that they need when they get frustrated. Now we teach them, take a breath just like in freeze dance. So that's a great, uh, a great way to teach the younger kids that self-regulation. -re Structured routines. So it's really important we know bedtime routine. Um, when my boys were little, they would take a bath at a specific time, we would read a book and then they would go to bed. And it was great, it was great for them, it was great for me. I had my time after they were in bed. But morning routines are just as important. So especially now when we're in this hybrid and virtual learning, it's important to know what the morning is gonna look like and how you're gonna prepare for that. So while your bedtime routine, maybe baths, books, and bed, um, you might have to add in there, tomorrow's a virtual day. Let's make sure that our workspace is set up. We have everything we need. What do you want for breakfast? We're gonna prepare as much as we can so it's ready to go. Um, for little kids, you wanna promote independence. So maybe if they have, if they want cereal in the morning, they make sure that they have their bowl 
and they're um, spoon ready. They have cereal in an accessible container for them and maybe a little bottle of milk in the refrigerator that's just like a one serving kind of thing. Promotes independence and it prepares them for the next day. Um, getting up, setting alarm at the same time every day is very important. And you can start that with little kids too. Um, first, second, third grades, have them set their alarms. And when that alarm goes up, they get up and they shut it off. Uh, maybe your morning routine involves a shower. I know I can't wake up without a shower in the morning. So <clears throat> you involve the shower, breakfast, and then you sit down for your day. Setting up calls, your virtual, your virtual classes, at least five minutes before the start of class. Um, at the high school level, I've heard many stories of kids throwing the blankets off of them and pulling the computer and sitting up in bed. Sometimes they're lying down. We get all kinds at the high school. But um, <clears throat> preparing for these calls at least five minutes ahead of time so that you're not feeling rushed and you're not, um, you know, you're taking care of that. That's that enduring self-care. Um, visual schedules, this is great for the younger kids, but can work for the older kids as well creating a visual schedule in which they have um, Velcro on the side and they can move their little person, their dot, whatever it is, down so they can see, they know what's expected of the day and they can see how far they've been um, and how much longer they have. Uh, we did setting alarms, having a dedicated space for learning. This is really important. Um, you know, as I said, at the high school level, sometimes we've got kids laying in bed, they're sitting in their room, they've got a TV, you can see the glare, that's always the giveaway, the glare in their glasses of the video games. Um, but setting up a, a dedicated space, whether it's in the living room, an office, where they don't have the distractions of laying in bed, or a TV, or those video games, you know, it's really hard at the, um, you know, the older levels when the kids have their own phones, and parents may be going to work. So how do you navigate that? Um, it's difficult. And I've, you know, I've had that challenge with my own kids. But for me, creating a space in the living room where my son had to go, that was where he was sitting. His phone was upstairs in my room. And that worked for us. So it's, it's testing spaces, finding out what's best for you. But all of these little things add up to calmness throughout the day. So I think that's the end of our presentation. Um, these are just some sites that we have here. I guess we'll be posting this presentation so you'll have access to it. Yep. So in conclusion, I just wanna thank you so much for joining yet another Zoom meeting in your schedule. Um, as social workers and school psychologists, we are available resources to you. We know that um, this was sort of a broad sweeping starting point for us in this SEL presentation and, and in, in an effort to help support you during a very difficult time um, in this pandemic. We're hoping that this is just the beginning of future presentations, and certainly this is one of a two-part series. So we will be following this up with um, a Q&A that's live and allows for interaction with you as parents so that we can take your questions in real time and provide some responses. Um, I hope that you reflect on this presentation and let us know what worked and what didn't work when we join with you again. Thank you very much, uh, Jess and Marie, and I hope everyone is well and has a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.